Hey everyone, my name is Alyssa Sinue. I'm an architectural specialist here at Artex. I just wanted to take a minute to say thank you for joining us for today's Learn From webinar. Um, to stay connected during this time of social distancing, we will host webinars every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Today is a very special edition of this weekly webinar series as we are welcoming special guest speaker, Mr. Peter Craig. Peter will be answering all of your previously submitted questions about moisture and concrete and early phase concrete management. Peter Craig is an independent concrete floor consultant with the firm Concrete Constructive. Peter has over 45 years experience with the design, construction, repair, and protection of concrete floor slabs. He is best known for his expertise in the area of moisture related flooring and coating problems and has been involved with over 400 such projects nationwide. Mr. Craig served as national president of ICRI in 1996 and is currently subcommittee chairman and a lead instructor for the ICRI moisture testing certification program. Mr. Craig is an active member of ICRI ASTM and ACI, where he currently serves as subcommittee chairman for the updating of ACI 302.2R. Peter is a fellow of ICRI and ACI, and in 2012 was voted as one of the five most influential people in the concrete industry. Peter was a critical consultant to Ardex in the development and patenting of our Ardex Concrete Management System, or ACMS, in 2013. He also published the article, Rise and Fall of Moisture-Related Flooring Problems in Concrete Construction in 2016, which overviewed the industry evolution to early phase concrete management systems. This is an extremely impressive list of accolades. Um, so one thing to note is that unfortunately, today's presentation does not count for AIA credits. However, this is an amazing opportunity to hear from the, one of the top experts in this field. We will resume our AIA accredited webinar content next week, covering proper substrate preparation. I also wanted to make note that additional courses are being added in the coming weeks. So stay tuned via email for more information. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Peter. So go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very appreciative for this opportunity to respond to your questions. Um, I've been speaking on the subject of moisture, slab construction, moisture-related problems for, for decades, really. And rather than go back over the fundamentals that most of you have heard numerous times, it was decided to just uh, poll those who were interested in attending and, and respond to their questions. One of the things that I absolutely hate about PowerPoint presentations in, in person is when somebody puts a slide up on the screen and just basically reads it to us. But we debated whether that would be helpful or not helpful in this type of format, and it was decided that, yeah, we'll put the the uh, uh, answers, if you will, or my responses in uh, up on the screen, as well as you listen to me verbalize them as well, so that um, two sentences are, are are employed, if you will. All right, so I, I think we had um, a little over 50 questions, and or some 50 questions in total. Uh, and divided into several segments. And uh, one of the segments that received the most questions had to do with uh, the use and effectiveness of, of admixtures and concrete. So I've grouped those 10 questions together and they're really closer to the end of this program than the beginning. So we'll go through all the other questions and then skip to, to those. So the first question, and I don't know who these are from. They, they did not share with me the names of who uh, uh, came up with these questions. But the first question is one that's actually been around for, for quite a few years. Is there a connection or correlation uh, between a concrete internal relative humidity measurement and the measurement of the concrete's moisture vapor emission rate? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, you can use one to help interpret the other, but the calcium chloride method 
which has been around for many, many, many years, and many years uh, earlier than what we're, we're, when you're new in this business, they tell you that this test was developed by the rubber flooring manufacturers back in the 1960s, and that's, that's not actually true. Um, the test in its crudest form was developed years before that by two flooring manufacturers, and it was, I believe it was the flooring, rubber flooring people were the first organization to recognize the test method. But what we've learned um, over the course of, of the last decade or so is the, the distinct limitations of a test that the flooring industry hung their hat on for many, many, many years. And what we've learned is that this test is only, if you will, uh, is only affected by moisture in the top one half to maybe up to three quarters of an inch in the concrete. And that research was conducted by Howard Kinnear and Scott Tarr, uh, good friends of mine, who are no longer at Construction Technologies Laboratory, now called the CTL Group. But when they were there together, they set up a test where they took a four-inch concrete slab uh, that had relative humidity sensors embedded into the concrete. Uh, so they could determine where was the moisture that the pearls, the calcium chloride pearls, where was the moisture they were absorbing coming from in the composite uh, depth of that, that slab. And what they found was that the only thing that changed was the only moisture that during the time period that was being absorbed into the calcium chloride pearls was coming from the top half to three quarters of an inch, which meant that there was still a, a significant reservoir of unmeasured moisture deeper in the concrete uh, that this test just told us absolutely nothing about. And it, it's because of that that we, in 2001, adopted the European method of uh, measuring uh, relative humidity in the concrete. So taking a, uh, the relative humidity at a proper depth is a predictor. The moisture vapor emission rate really isn't a predictor. And it, another, uh, uh, another reason that it's come into such question is because the, the calcium fluoride pearls are high, uh, are actually hygroscopic. So they're drawing moisture to themselves that may not naturally be emitting from the concrete. But relative humidity testing is a predictor. And when you take the measurement at the prescribed depth, and that would be for a concrete slab on the ground or on metal deck that is only free to lose moisture from the top, the depth would be 40% of the slab thickness. So if, it, for example, if the slab was five inches thick, 40% of the slab thickness is two inches. So by taking a measurement at two inches into the slab, whatever number you get at that depth is the predictor of what the slab will be top to bottom once it's covered. For example, when the concrete, and this is assuming now that the ground is taken out of play, that there is an effective low permeance vapor retarder directly underneath the concrete or we're on metal decking. When the concrete hit that uh, base, if you will, be it the vapor retarder, the ground, or the metal decking, it, it's soaking wet. It's 100% relative humidity top to bottom. Now, our ambient conditions are 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 50% relative humidity. And over the course of the weeks and months that follow, moisture will evaporate from the surface of the slab. And ultimately, the relative humidity in the very top of the slab will equilibrate with whatever the relative humidity is in the ambient environment. So in this case, it's 50%. But as we go deeper into the concrete, the relative humidity increases. Now, when we cover the surface of the slab with a low permeance floor covering or coating, that gradient will now reestablish itself as a straight line. But because we've lost a measure of moisture, it won't be 100% anymore. It will be, in this case, 80%. And the research that was done uh, in, uh, by Lund, in, at Lund University, Lund University uh, repeatedly showed that where the drying curve and the redistribution equilibrium state, uh, where those lines intersected, always fell at approximately 40% of the slab thickness. So that's why a measurement at, in a five inch slab at two inches down uh, is reflective or predictive of what we can expect the moisture in the concrete level, the RH level to be, top to bottom once the slab is covered. Um, so the question two was, 
if if the test only measures moisture in the top three quarters of an inches, inches, why is it still recommended as a viable concrete test? Well, um, it has absolutely fallen out of favor in, in a lot of circles, uh, but because it, it's it's been so uh, widely referenced and used uh, over many many decades, there there's a reluctance on the part uh, of some people to completely get rid of it, even though two thirds of the people on our ASTM committee that writes the standard for it uh, are ready to get rid of it all, already. Um, but without hesitation, I will say that if measurement of the moisture vapor emission rate uh, by the calcium chloride method is the only test you conduct, you have insufficient information to base, to flooring, base a flooring installation upon. I am in the group that still believe, I, I like to have every piece of information I can have. So I still find, conduct the test to obtain a, a piece of information. But again, alone, it's totally insufficient information. Can you, question three, can I discuss or can you discuss dew point application temperatures in the best time of day or conditions to apply a moisture mitigation system? Well, by definition, dew point is the temperature at which water vapor condenses into liquid. Here you see the a dew point chart. And, and the point I want to illustrate is how close a dew point temperature can actually be to ambient conditions. For instance, here we have an 80 degree Fahrenheit day with ambient relative humidity at 90%. The dew point is only three degrees lower than the ambient. Which means, and you can use a, a classic example is is, come, is is taking a shower, opening the shower stall door, and and that humid, warm humid air condenses on your mirror, which is colder. That's that's dew point. Uh, but the point here is, it can at times be be very close. Um, ideally, uh, when you're applying a moisture mitigation system, uh, the surface temperature of the concrete would be at normal service conditions, but that's that's not always possible. In fact, it's seldom possible in new construction, but you really do need, if you will, to not be, well, in my personal opinion, I don't want to be applying an epoxy on a, on a concrete substrate that's below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Ideally, the ideal range between 65 and 85. Historically, you'll find in the coatings industry that they do not want you to uh, install a coating when the surface temperature of the concrete is within five degrees of the dew point. I've seen some more recent publications that suggest it should be not be within 10 degrees, and I think part of that has to do with just the, the accuracy of the instrumentation that we're, that we're measuring these temperatures at. But whether it's five or 10, it needs to be a, a, a definite difference to not put the uh, application at risk of a dew point condensation issue. What's the best time of day to install a moisture mitigation product? If for, for whatever reason uh, or the situation is such that you're trying to apply any type of a coating to concrete in a, an exterior environment, uh, and I've, been through, I've lived this painfully, uh, the last thing you want to do is try to apply it in, in the morning uh, as the, the deck or the slab is, is warming uh, by the sunlight, but you'll end up having a terrible time uh, with pinholes, if you will, uh, as the air in the pores, if you will, of the, of the surface is expanding uh, and creating pinholes. So ideally, if you're in the open, you want to wait till the, 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 the slab has reached its maximum temperature, so the air is already expanded and actually beginning, beginning to, uh, to cool. Now, if you're inside, um, what we typically would like to do after we've prepared the surface uh, according to the manufacturer's recommendations. Uh, we're not so worried about sunlight, but we do want to cover the windows so that the, if there's any uh, opportunity for sunlight to cascade through through the windows onto the floor, we want to avoid that. Um, but what we do is we the night before, we raise the temperature in the room provided that we have uh, the HVAC system running or some way of doing that. And again, we're, what we're doing is ex pre-expanding the air uh, in the pore surface pore structure of, of the concrete uh, to, and so that the morning when we come in to put the coating down, we drop the temperature back down 
to 10 degrees and everything is cooling and drawing the material as opposed to the air expanding and perhaps creating a, a series of, of, of pinholes in, in, the, in our coating system while it's still in an uncured state. Question four, at what relative humidity level should a moisture mitigation system be used and which system do you recommend? I'm very conservative. And the reason I say 85% is because I'm one who believes that liquid moisture can develop in the pore structure and capillary structure of concrete at less than 100% relative humidity. The capillary, capillaries in concrete are, are, are thought to measure in the millionths of an inch diameter. So it's not something you can even, even see readily. So a lot of it's theoretical. But what's not theoretical is no one believes that a capillary is, is like a straw, having a uniform diameter. And as it is with capillary action in soil structures, when the gap is so tight and so narrow, the forces of cohesion ad and adhesion of a water molecule uh, can actually cause the, the water to, to drop, if you will, liquid water to rise. But as it reaches a, a, a larger void space, it can, it can undergo phase change uh, from a, a liquid to a vapor. And that could happen a number of times in its migration upward and through concrete. And because the capillary structure of, con of good quality concrete is not continuous, we don't have an open avenue and we don't have a poor avenue, we don't have a capillary avenue from the bottom to the top. There's a number of other means or mechanisms um, that get quite involved as how moisture actually, if you will, transmits into and through a, a concrete slab. But this, my personal safe numbers is 85%, and I know that flies in the face of lots of these modern day uh, statements being made by adhesive manufacturers and so on and so forth. But from a conservative standpoint, 85% is, is the target. Now, some of you may remember when we first published, when we first adopted relative humidity testing in this country, in our document ASTM F710, which is standard practice for preparing concrete subfloors to receive resilient flooring, we showed a table that showed uh, in absence of a manufacturer's uh, stated value, 75%. Well, 75% was put in there because it, we, everyone knew or believed that uh, we wouldn't have a problem at 75%, and I truly believe that. But I had the privilege of overseeing studies on the in-situ test method uh, at the Grace Laboratories outside of Boston back in 2009 and 2010. And in a controlled environment, absolutely controlled at 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 50% relative humidity, we never reached an internal relative humidity in these concrete slabs in 13 months. So 75% is a totally unrealistic, if you will, target value uh, for a concrete slab to dry naturally to, to on its own, okay? Question five, is there a concrete mixture that provides a low water cement ratio for faster turnaround in slabs? Do superplasticizers still exist and are they worthwhile? Uh, in answer to the question, yes, there are concrete mixtures out there uh, that, by one or more mechanisms, uh, accelerate, if you will, the, the drying of, of a concrete slab. However, uh, those technologies uh, are not readily available in many parts of the country. Uh, and ha having been involved with, with some of them over the, the past decade, uh, not all of them are particularly user friendly, and we've, they've, they've met some resistance from from concrete contractors who are are used to handling plain vanilla concrete. And when you try to deal with these, if you will, um, specialty uh, mixes, uh, it can be quite challenging. So they, while they they do exist. And really, it would be a wonderful thing to have a concrete solution to a concrete problem. And I, I've said that many, many times. They just have not found their way uh, across the country and, and gained the popularity that you might think that they could. Do superplasticizers exist and are they still, or are they worthwhile? Yes, absolutely. Superplasticizers still exist uh, and they are used. And um, depending on the dosage, 
uh, there used to be two classes. We used to say mid-range and high-range, but a lot of times it's just a matter of dosage of a high-range to create a mid-range. Uh, the problem, if you will, they can be excellent, uh, absolutely excellent for industrial slabs that don't have floor coverings or coatings. But some of the newer generation of, of admixtures, if you will, and I'm not talking about the moisture mitigation admixture, I'm just talking about concrete performance admixtures uh, have demonstrated some adverse effects as it relates to uh, floor coverings and coatings. Some of these sulfonated, I, I was involved in a, a million dollar issue out in a hospital in San Francisco where because of a new class of admixture that was put in the concrete, again, these are not the silicates, these are just regular uh, ready mix type admixtures uh, for concrete performance. Uh, I'm not going to mention names, but uh, they weren't able to stick to the floor. Uh, and then they spent an extra million dollars on on this project, if you will, uh, getting that floor to a condition where they could properly uh, adhere the flooring. Uh, so I personally, uh, I've grown up with type A water reducers. Uh, and again, what we do, and you're gonna hear me say a lot about this later on, there is a stink, distinct difference in, in the way we think about designing a concrete mixture uh, and slab design for flooring installations than we do for other types of exposed, perhaps uh, industrial warehouse floors. Two distinct categories, and they uh, unfortunately have been linked together in, in way, way too many projects, if you will. Question six, looking ahead to post-COVID-19 construction practices, are you anticipating changes to fax track construction projects? Uh, practices. I, I really don't think so. Um, as I'm sure all you know, it, uh, one of the, the driving forces behind <laughs> fast track construction is the cost of money. Now, granted, the cost of money is, has come down uh, significantly, but I, I think as and we get back to the new normal, whatever that is, I think that will come back into play, that the reason we're getting things, getting them up and open uh, and generating revenue or, or whatever they're making, uh, if you will, will be subject to the, to the, to the same issues as it, as it relates to finances. So I don't think we're going to see a big change there. Question seven, can you address the cause and effect issues associated with ASR, which is alkali silica reaction uh, in concrete? What causes ASR in concrete? Their alkali silica reaction is a phenomenon that's been known and, and, and written about for, for many, many years. Um, I don't know, it was 15 years ago, I and a number of colleagues uh, began to recognize a, a, a variation of ASR. I, I, I equate ASR and NSAR, near surface alkali reaction, with two forms of cancer. ASR is a very slow growing cancer where NSAR is a cancer that can develop uh, at a much shorter period of time. Both, however, require that in the concrete mixture itself, and this can be in the coarse or fine aggregate, that there are particles that really should not be in the mixture. And these particles are potentially reactive, and reactive in a saturated, high alkaline environment which an unprotected concrete, a slab on ground that's unprotected from below can, can easily, easily become, okay? If the relative humidity in the concrete is 80% uh, or higher, it provides the fuel, if you will, for an alkali condition to develop, exist, and for these particles to be affected. Now, with a classic ASR condition, with a coarse aggregate particle, when ASR begins to develop, what happens is a, an expansive gel forms on the surface or the periphery of the aggregate particle, and that gel is like a crystal of ice, and it will act, it can actually create a force uh, great enough to fracture the concrete. Again, it's a very slow process; usually takes five to ten years to even begin to to be seen. Whereas NSAR uh, occurs much more quickly. Why? Because when you cover the floor uh, with a floor covering or low permeance coating uh, and you don't have a protected slab, that uh, condensation plane, if you will, develops right at the surface of the, right below 
the floor covering and coating and puts those potentially reactive uh, particles, aggregate particles, uh, into that caustic high pH solution much quicker than it would throughout the body of the slab. Question eight, have you seen an increase in independent testing needed on projects? Well, there's no question in my mind that testing of slabs increased significantly over uh, the past 20 years, as has the call for independent third-party testing. Uh, we're also starting to so, so begin to see, well, it was 10 years ago that we started the ICRI moisture testing certification course. And over the, the past decade, I believe we're now up somewhere close to 2,000 technicians have gone through uh, and, and, and passed that course and become certified. So not only do I think that we've seen an increase in testing uh, on projects, um, but we are now beginning to see in specifications call, call for uh, uh, whoever is doing the testing, moisture testing on a project to be uh, third party independent and that they be uh, ICRI certified. Now, we are seeing some reduction perhaps in the overall volume of, of testing because there are companies out there, we'll get to that later, uh, who are saying you don't even have to bother. With our product, you don't even bother testing, but we'll, that's a, a discussion point for later on. Question nine is a, or nine A, is a, a non porous slab like a power towel finish a deal breaker when it comes to adhesive? Um, droplet test taking 30 minutes are greater to absorb. Um, it really makes uh, a difference as to what type of adhesive and what type of flooring installation uh, is going to take place. For a uh, VCT tile or dimensional tile installation, um, if you're using a water-based acrylic adhesive, yeah, it would be helpful for the surface to have a degree of porosity. But because we can stand back and, and let a fair degree of the free water and the adhesive uh, evaporate before we have to lay in the tile and roll it, uh, we've got some greater latitude than we do if we're doing sheet goods. Sheet goods require, uh, you can't let the adhesive set anywhere near as long as you can a dimensional tile installation. So they're often referred to as, as wet set or semi-wet set uh, installations. Um, and in those cases, if the surface of the slab is not, does not readily absorb that excess water, several things uh, can happen. And I'm going to show you in a, in, a, in a minute what that can look like. So do I recommend that every slab surface be ground? Again, it depends. It absolutely depends. Uh, I don't recommend every slab. I mean, there are 100% solid epoxy adhesives, uh, urethane adhesives that don't have water in them and require that free water to, to be absorbed. So uh, it, it really depends on what type of product. Yeah, that you're going to be applying. Now, what are the consequences of not grinding the adhesive? Well, here's, here it is. These are both sheet goods. I know it looks like plank, but the one on the left is a sheet good installation. Okay, uh, the adhesive got spread, and they waited as long as they could, installed it, rolled it. Everything looked great, but because the surface of the slab had been power troweled to a burnished, dense, non-porous finish, that free water was not readily absorbed. And everything looked great. Everything looked great when they, they installed it, rolled the floor. But the, uh, what you're seeing on the left is right in front of the uh, the elevators and the, and the turning arc of where the gurneys and, uh, and, and other wheel transport equipment uh, is making their turn onto, the, onto or off of the elevator. And that adhesive never achieved the degree of hardness or set that it really was intended. And you're seeing another operating suite on the right can't see it as readily. This is, was out in, I think, all the New York. Again, where that adhesive, uh, because of the lack of surface porosity, uh, never achieves the degree of, of performance that it was intended to perform. Question 10. How does moisture content directly affect the compressive strength, or does it? Uh, cement particles in a concrete mixture absolutely need water. Uh, to hydrate, and the hydration process uh, continues indefinitely uh, as long as the relative humidity in the concrete is 80% or higher. 
Uh, my mentor was a wonderful, wonderful German engineer by the name of Hermann Protz. And Hermann Protz was involved uh, in the, uh, prior to the big dig in Boston, with taking um, cylinders, if you will, core samples out of the tunnels that had been uh, constructed back, I think, in the 1930s. That concrete went in in the 30s at about 2,500 psi. But in 19, whatever it was, eight, in the late 80s, early 90s, when when Herman took those cores and had them broken, the PSI was over 7,000. So the compressive strength can continue to increase over time as long as there's sufficient moisture to continue the hydration process. Okay. Question 11. How long should the HVAC system be on prior to testing for RH? Currently, the ASTM F2170 test method uh, for conducting a concrete internal relative humidity says that the building has to be at service conditions. We're not quite sure how that got through. Uh, it is the ideal, without question, but for new construction, it's 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 just seldom achievable. Uh, I do believe that you're going to see us uh, modify that to have a a, a, a window of variance to that uh, requirement. Uh, but for all of the moisture tests, those conditions, the whatever conditions are deemed necessary have to be established and verified 48 hours uh, before we start and maintained throughout the, the test period. Uh, but I do think you're gonna see that 65 to 85 range that you see for calcium chloride testing become applicable to in situ relative humidity. Right now it says service conditions. Question 12. General contractors have been using dissipative curing compounds for new concrete slab placements. These products claim to be worn off with foot traffic and exposed and exposure to sunlight. In terms of prep for moisture mitigation, do you recommend going right over these or should they be removed mechanically before any subsequent rotation? Well dissipative hydrocarbon resin curing compounds they do break down over time due to uh, exposure to sunlight, ultraviolet light, or in some cases, some break down in a, in a high pH environment. Uh, the process, however, is very slow, and uh, foot traffic, uh, you can't rely on foot traffic to remove the material uh, from the surface of the slab in all areas. For example, uh, when they cast a slab, it's wide open. But within the weeks and months that, that follows, take a school or a hospital, they're, they're framing, okay? They're framing out the, the walls. Now you have a number of reverse right angle corners where no traffic is taking place whatsoever. So sure, uh, in the aisleways where repetitive traffic, perhaps it's worn off, but you've got all kinds of areas where the, that surface residue or the film itself may may still remain. So absolutely, mechanical abrasion uh, is is necessary if a, if a curing compound of any sort uh, has been used on the surface of that slab. Absolutely. Question 13: For an existing concrete slab on ground with no vapor retarder present below the slab, have you found a foolproof system that works 100% of the time for high moisture? The truth is that I don't know of any company in the moisture, slab moisture mitigation business that can truthfully say, state that they have a perfect track record. There are some that do, but I do not believe that they're telling the truth. Why? Because I've investigated a number of failures from a number of companies who continue to make those statements, and I just know it's not true. Okay, so now there. That said. There are systems that are hands and arms more successful than others, and our sponsor certainly is one of them. Uh, will moisture wick up existing interior walls? Well, uh, moisture really, we've learned that moisture really doesn't have an avenue of passage laterally in concrete to any significant measure. Uh, and if you think about it, if it did, uh, when we put down a, a floor covering over a room, uh, and, and all the moisture would go, it'd be like a chimney effect right to the wall cavity. And that sim simply is not the case. And I, I use the picture uh, in this, at the bottom to illustrate that point. 
This was a job I did down in Buford, Georgia, in a paper storage warehouse where those beige rolls in the background uh, of very expensive coated paper were being damaged because moisture was transmitting through the slab. Um, and I won't go into all the details of, of, of what went on except to say, to use this slide, picture to illustrate. That nobody wanted to believe moisture was coming through the slab, so I put a rubber doormat down for a week and came back, peeled it back, and it's wringing wet, soaking wet underneath that mat. The point is, though, it was as wet, dark and wet to the outside edge of that mat as it was in the center. If moisture were traveling laterally to any degree, I would have expected to see a gradient with it be lighter on the outside and progressively darker to the center. It's just not the case, so uh, I'm not concerned. Now, obviously, if you have gypsum wallboard in direct contact with the surface of the slab, yeah, you can have some concerns, but uh, that's not the recommendation for installing gypsum board. Question five, with the type of water you use in a mix ratio, I think it means in a concrete mixture like well water or city water, affect the concrete cure time? If so, is one type of water better than another? Um, I've had a number of questions that I think when people are saying cure time, they really mean dry time because there's there are two distinct uh, different sets of, of conditions, if you will, or, or activities. We'll get to that. Um, by and large, Potable water is, is used in a, in, a, in a concrete mixture, but uh, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be potable as long as the uh, pH of that water uh, is within that six to eight range, and it doesn't take, taste uh, saline, saline or, or look brackish, if you will. Uh, it's considered acceptably, but the, the largest percentage is, is, is potable water or drinkable water. Um, it doesn't affect the cure time, as I said, which is totally different than, than the drying time. So here again, how long are the average cure times for concrete going over? Uh, uh, cure times for concrete going over is three inches thick and more. Well, uh, the cure time is the same for a concrete slab, regardless of its thickness. Okay, the cure, because the definition of curing, or the operation of curing, is to maintain is temp maintenance of temperature and moisture in the slab for a specific period of time for the concrete to, to develop its ultimate, or if it will, or its design uh, physical properties. So curing and drying take place over two distinctly different time periods. This was a study done at the Portland Cement Association years ago where they cast four different concrete slabs out in the backyard. The slab at the bottom, they just struck it off, bull floated, and left it. The second one, second one from the bottom, the second uh, chart line that you see, uh, is they cured it, kept it wet for three days, uh, and then exposed it to the air. The third line, they uh, uh, kept it wet for uh, seven days and uh, uncovered it and exposed it to the air. And uh, the top solid line, um, they kept that slab moist cured, moist covered, if you will, for 180 days. And you can see that uh, if they did nothing, uh, the compressive strength of that slab with no curing only achieved 50% of its design potential. Three days, basically 75%, and at seven days, it was 100, close to 100%. That's where you get the, you've heard it for years, you know, a seven-day cure. And whether it's a wet cure or a cover cure, maintaining satisfactory temperature and maintaining the moisture in the slab uh, is curing, not drying. Now, when we get to drying, it's a totally different uh, set of numbers. This is a summary of work that was done at the Portland Cement Association by a, a very famous uh, researcher by the name of Harold Brewer. And Harold conducted a number of studies, but this is the by far the most widely referenced study, where three categories of specimens were, were tested. Uh, basically, a vessel that was uh, closed on all sides but the top, uh, a vessel that had water, had, had fill material water, uh, but no vapor retardant, nothing preventing uh, moisture from below from reaching the slab, and the third specimen where he actually brought liquid water in contact with the uh, underside of, of the specimen. And uh, you can see that uh, basically a water cement ratio of 0 0.50 equates to 4,000 pound concrete. So from the time Dr. Brewer uh, conducted his experiment, 
It took 82 days for the sealed vessel, the slab, if you will, to seal the slab. Let's, let's say slab on an effective vapor tartar on a metal deck to dry to a three pound moisture emission rate. What unfortunately it doesn't show in this kind of study is are a number of things. One, these specimens did not receive a machine troweled hard steel burnished finish, which basically uh, creates a, a cap on the concrete that slows down, if you will, uh, the free release of moisture uh, from the slab. Uh, they didn't receive a curing compound. They were cast in a laboratory uh, under roof, uh, not out in the open, exposed to rainfall, and so on and so forth. So you, you can't think of it being three months or 82 days, call it three months, uh, from the time the slab's placed. On a construction project, we don't start what I call the drying clock until the building is totally closed in, if you will, uh, not subjected, closed in, watertight, and the ambient conditions are conducive to drying. The old adage, damp clothes on a damp day don't dry. So th there are parts of this country at certain times of the year where it's virtually impossible to get a slab uh, to dry naturally to an acceptable level. Now there are areas like uh, Nevada, uh, Denver, some areas that have extremely low relative humidity, where if the slab surface were open enough to freely release its moisture, you got you got half a chance uh, if you've got a, a, a very prolonged uh, construction schedule. Uh, but it's not going to happen in two or three months. And, and if you look at the slab that wasn't uh, adequately protected or the slab that actually uh, had water in contact, uh, even in the laboratory, those slabs never reached the target level uh, in, in less than a year. It didn't happen. So drying and curing are two distinctly different time periods. What is the cost time benefit of mitigating moisture in a slab versus letting it cure? Again, I think I think they mean dry. Okay, um, as I said, they're not the same. Um, it, it can be it can be significant. It, it really can because um, depending on the slab design, the surface finish, the curing method, and closure time, uh, as I said, it can take many months, if not more than a year, uh, for a concrete slab to uh, to dry to an acceptable level. And if you haven't made the decision ahead of time. Uh, to mitigate moisture and take opportunity to do so early in the in the construction process. Now you're if you wait to the what I call the 23rd hour, you're framed, you're sheetrocked, you got six or eight other trades in the building trying to work at the same time, and now you're going to uh, uh, you know implement a moisture mitigation strategy. Uh, it becomes a, a much more difficult situation. What do I see as the number one problem in today's concrete construction? Well, again, it depends on what arena we're, we're referring to, but as it relates to floor covering uh, and coating installations, I, I believe, again, as I said earlier, that it has to do with uh, not thinking differently uh, about designing a concrete slab for floor coverings than we do for other types of uh, concrete slab. Uh, uh, requirements or, or installations like a warehouse floor, a parking garage, or so on and so forth. Um, those can, those things that we do to enhance the performance of concrete for a warehouse or a parking garage or uh, other struct, uh, anything other than where we're putting, going to cover the slab with a low permanent floor covering or, uh, or coating. Um, uh, those thoughts or those processes really are different, need to be different. Well, the, what we do needs to be different for slabs that are going to receive a floor covering or a finish. If I could make the change, what do you have? What would you have the construction industry do differently in concrete construction? Uh, first of all, I'd make sure that every concrete slab on ground had a, a low permeance vapor retarder with a permeance of less than 0 0.01 perms, and I would do that. Make sure that that those num that achieve number is achieved not only before but after that material is put through the performance, if you will, requirements of ASTM E1745 
which are, uh, basically replicates uh, what's going to happen to that material uh, when it's in the ground over uh, a prolonged period of time. There are a lot of materials that look pretty good uh, until you subject them to those tests, and then they their values drop off off significantly. So, and we have you know for years and years and years. Big box warehouses weren't putting vapor targets under their slabs. That has changed significantly uh, since into in ACI 302.1 uh, and 302.2. Uh, we make the recommendation that if uh, moisture sensitive product is going to be stored directly on uh, the slab surface, uh, that that big warehouse slab wants to have a vapor target directly under the concrete. And I can tell you stories of jobs I've been on where we've actually had to tear out uh, hundreds of thousands of square foot of slab uh, because they could not safely store uh, moisture sensitive product directly on the, on the floor. Uh, so a lot of that mindset has changed. And the other thing is a lot of the a lot of the developers, and I work with a number of them that do the big box warehouses, or, uh, whoever they're building it for, uh, maybe themselves, maybe for somebody else. Uh, uh, are spec warehouses, uh, or over the course of, of the last 20 years, there have been a lot of spec warehouses built. You don't know what the requirements of, of the people that are going to occupy uh, the building or sections of the building are. So by having the vapor tire properly, the, the, the right vapor tire properly installed, they are they have greater latitude as to doing anything they want with that slab than if it wasn't there. Okay. Uh, the other thing is I want to make sure that uh, where the slab design takes into consideration uh, what potential effects curling and or uh, random cracking and uh, moving joints are going to have on the flooring installation. We'll talk about that in a moment, more in a moment. Question 20. I have a pinless moisture meter for drywall, masonry, and wood. Why can't I use this to measure the moisture in my concrete? Well, there are meters that have a number of, uh, of different settings, uh, some of which will do uh, a number, including uh, concrete. Uh, so you need to check and see if, if that is uh, applicable to your particular instrument. Uh, none of these instruments, as it relates to concrete, are ever uh, to be used as a standalone deal, no deal, go or no go uh, uh, determining factor, although I do know of one major uh, coating uh, manufacturer who uh, stands by using this test with the thought that uh, as long as the top half to inch half inch of the concrete uh, passes the, a meter test that once their system is installed it's not going to matter I'm not sure that I totally agree with that but in the flooring industry uh, we wrote a standard F 2659 for the use of uh, a particular class of, uh, of meters and it, we're we're clear to express that uh, we're not to use these values as uh, 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 the final decision-making factor if it's safe to put down uh, the floor covering or, or coating. And what's interesting is, I think over my career, I've owned six or seven different types of moisture meters, and and no two of them have the have the same scale. Uh, I've got moisture meters that have a zero to a six scale. Uh, 0 to 20, 0 to 40, 0 to 100, 0 to 1,000. Um, they are all relative numbers. There is never more than 7% moisture by weight in a concrete slab from the day it hits the ground. So the only meter that even begins to make sense from a moisture percentage standpoint uh, would be the, the 0 to 6 plus scale, not the others. Now, all of the others may have uh, published parameters is what they consider to be acceptable. Getting back there again, never to be used as a pass fail, uh, pass go or no go test. Now, it can be very helpful. I carry a meter with me. If I'm going to go test a, a floor, uh, particularly in new construction, I, I will carry a, a, a meter with me. Why? Here's a job that we're being asked to, to, to test. The HVAC system is not on. Uh, the building's closed in. The roof is on. The building's watertight. But the windows aren't in. They've got poly stapled to the window frame. Well, that poly's torn, and it rained uh, three days ago, and the, the outside edge uh, of the of the slab uh, was soaking wet from water that came through the torn poly onto the outside edge. Now, it's when I got there three days later, the water's gone. 
but if I put the meter <laughs> on that outside edge, it, it spikes the needle. Whereas if I come in 10 or 12 feet, I get a totally different measurement. So a meter can be really helpful uh, in determining where am I going to conduct my truly quantitative test as compared to what I call, even though the meters are giving us a number which can be considered quantitative, it really is still uh, a qualitative measurement, but it, it can be, I believe it can be helpful in those type of situations. Question 21, on a government site in Phoenix, the flooring installer insisted on installing flooring floor adhesive prior to setting the calcium chloride test. Claimed that the test should be real life and that the adhesive would obviously be used as part of the flooring system. The city inspector accepted their explanation and allowed them to proceed. Good decision? Absolutely not. I'll tell you what, if anything goes wrong with that floor, both the installer and the inspector are going to be hung out to dry. There's absolutely no basis for, uh, for to doing what they did totally scientifically wrong, inconsistent with the standard itself, absolutely, totally wrong. 22, how to prevent concrete cracking on elevated comp uh, composite decks? Well, uh, very hard, if not impossible to do. Uh, even with the lowest shrinkage concrete mixtures that we know how to create, uh, you, got, you got to expect some cracking. What's important is that there's a plan ahead of time. But what are we going to do with those cracks or curled slabs, uh, elevated slabs, before we install the flooring. Uh, I've been involved with a, a major hospital problem where all of the random cracks and joints are telegraphing through the flooring and, the, and they're not going to accept it. All of that, I mean, this is an operating hospital and those, 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 uh, that flooring is going to have to be removed, the cracks and joints properly treated, and, uh, and then the flooring installed while the hospital is still in operation. I'll show you. Here's some pictures, okay? Uh, in all cases, okay? The flooring installer, we may have had these slabs sections at the joints or cracks, may have had even a small measure of, of curl or upward warping. The, uh, con uh, the flooring installer may have grounded nice and level, may have uh, floated up to it, or over it and, and leveled it out, smoothed it out, okay? Forgetting that when a slab curls it, or warps upward, it's lost contact with the base. Whether that base is the vapor tart or the ground or the metal decking, there's a void. And now when you come in and you put your floor covering or coating over the surface, the moisture gradient that led to the warping, that gradient subsides, the curling stresses subsides, the slab edges go down and puts whatever is in compression in or above the joint or crack into compression. You have got to understand that there are things that need to be considered. Okay, the concrete's going to crack, but we need to have a plan ahead of time. What are we going to do about it? Because I'm going to tell you, these, these are going to be unbelievably expensive uh, corrections. Question 23A, now that there are more product offerings for adhesives that can endure high RH and pH, are you seeing less failures than prior to those products coming in the market? Um, honestly, I believe whatever reduction we're seeing has more to do with the fact that a large percentage of our new uh, concrete, uh, new, new building construction, moisture mitigation is an integral part of the design uh, and the construction process. I think that's had more to do with the reduction, if you will, uh, of flooring failures than, than anything else, okay? Uh, these adhesives, uh, there are a number of adhesives out there from major manufacturers now. We warranty to 90%, 93%, I've seen some 95 there are even some that, that claim up, up, up to 100 But the ones that, that say 90%, uh, there's still that's still a limit. Uh, and I'll tell you where we get into trouble. Um, it's it's next to impossible. If you have a warranty that says 90%, but the instrument that you're measuring relative humidity with has a tolerance of plus or minus two up to 90, and it goes from three uh, and above and higher at, at RH levels 90 or, or higher, how do you prove what number it actually is? It gets to be a, a real pissing match. When something goes wrong and the warranty is tied to a, uh, 
uh, a 90 percent or, uh, or any relative humidity um, warranty in the in the 90s. Very very difficult battle ahead. High moisture adhesives. Some claim they can be used at 100 percent even with no intact vapor barrier, vapor retarder. Have you seen these? Does pH factor in? Concern for condensation. And another question similar to it: High RH adhesives are being introduced everywhere. Nobody is saying that these still need to be used on a closed system. How do we handle this? Well, simple answer is uh, I became aware of two no limit adhesives many years ago. Uh, I have studied one of them in particular over several uh, generations of, of its developments, development, and I have seen it keep flooring down where nothing else uh, has been able to. However, I, on one particular hospital job uh, where we were able to put in a waiting room, uh, they gave us as a test area uh, where, where other systems had failed, took up, prepared, properly prepared the surface, put that no limit, 100% adhesive down, and we came back every three to six months to, to check it. And it was plank flooring, so we would lift it. And there were actually droplets of water uh, that were forming. The flooring was still uh, no distortions in the flooring. The flooring was well adhered, but there were there was moisture, uh, if you will, droplets uh, underneath that system or within that system. And of course, the hospital was was concerned if there's moisture, there's a potential for mold, uh, and they they would not go that route. So. Uh, but I am well, well, well aware that those systems exist. Uh, question 24, do I see mold and mildew becoming a larger legal issue in the construction since there's industry since there's a lot more emphasis on using products so that you don't have to mitigate from moisture? Um, mold, <laughs> mold and mildew is, is always a, a serious concern. Uh, I, I've been through a number of huge, huge uh, cases. Um, and it, it, the problem is it becomes, as the allergists will tell you, it's very difficult to, to prove if somebody's health issue is directly related uh, to, to mold or, or not. Um, so, uh, but it is a very valid, valid concern. Uh, there are a number of products now, um, a lot of carpet tile systems that are saying, don't even have to test for moisture. We don't care what the moisture is. Uh, we're putting down our system without adhesive. They're using these little adhesive tabs, if you will, in the corners, um, and they don't they don't seem to care. Uh, my experience with those type of systems, as well as some of the non-adhered uh, sheet moisture mitigation uh, systems, if if you don't open up the surface of that slab, particularly if you're a slab on ground without a vapor retarder. If you don't open up that slab so that the rising moisture that condenses underneath these um, PPC rubber backed uh, ca carpet tiles or uh, sheet vapor retarder uh, membranes, if you don't open up the surface such that the rising moisture can be, re when it condenses, can be reabsorbed into the surface, you end up with a film. Uh, if you will, of liquid water underneath the flooring and underneath the systems. Now, in a carpet tile installation, you'll get seams every 18 inches, 24 inches, whatever the dimensional size of the carpet tile is, um, and you absolutely can have a, have a mold condition uh, develop. So, uh, mold is an issue, and I personally have uh, serious concerns uh, when it comes to putting these non-adhered systems down if we don't properly uh, give consideration either mitigating the moisture or uh, making sure that the surface is capable of reabsorbing condensed moisture under the flooring system. 25, is there an industry publication that outlines the number or percentage of failed tests under 2170 or 1869 that are acceptable? Uh, no, there isn't. Um, as it relates to uh, determining if it's safe to put uh, uh, down a floor covering or coating, um, there's a lot more that you need to know than just what what the moisture level is, uh, particularly if it's a, if it's a forensic investigation. Um, so let me go back to that. I want to go back to that question just to make sure everything. There is no industry publication uh, that tells you what percentage, if you will, of the failed tests. When you get into a forensic investigation, 
the frequency of, of testing is far less than what is required uh, for pre-installation new construction. And it's really left up to the judgment uh, of the uh, uh, of the technician or the inspector or whoever is responsible for making the determination or presenting that information to the manufacturer as to the number of tests that they believe are statistically significant enough to base an informed decision upon or opinion upon. Uh, one of my personal thoughts on limited moisture control uh, products that want, want to some value below 100 pence or want to some value. Some of these will word it a little different. Uh, basically what it's saying is, what are my thoughts on systems that don't warranty to 100%? Well, it, it, any slab that doesn't have an effective vapor tar directly under the concrete, I don't, you put sand or gravel over the top of it, it basically negates its effectiveness. And I know we did that, and we told people to do that a long time ago for many years, but the, everything has changed. All of the standards, all the recommendations today, vapor tar has got to be in direct contact with the underside of the slab. If it's not there, then the moisture mitigation system must have no moisture or pH limits, okay? The relative humidity, a lot of people don't, I struggled with this, but it's a fact. The relative humidity under every building in America, once that slab covers the ground, is 100%. And it's not new information. It was published decades ago by the National Academy of Sciences, where they basically state that regardless of the depth of the water table or the amount of, of rainfall, it's 100% relative humidity under that slab. And I can attest to it. I had the privilege of working at the Sandita National Laboratories down in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, the water table's over a thousand feet below the surface of the slab, but the relative humidity directly underneath that concrete, okay, in the ground is 100% relative humidity. It doesn't matter if the water table is six feet down or a thousand and six feet down. 27, what are Ardex options for high moisture levels up to 99% plus when you know there's no moisture barrier below the slab in, on, or below grade. Uh, Ardex does have systems that can be used on, on slabs uh, that don't have a vapor tardis. So uh, my suggestion is that you contact the local Ardex uh, representative or uh, the Ardex technical department for information on what systems they feel are appropriate for a given set of uh, conditions. Quote 28. What advice can you provide to help an architectural sales representative become more successful in having architectural firms specify early phase concrete management systems? Well, there are uh, a number of advantages to being able to uh, mitigate moisture in a floor slab, okay, in the weeks that follow uh, the placement. Um, you know, we've gone through what I call an evolution of uh, on moisture mitigation where 20 years ago, um, it might not have been on everybody's radar screen. And then as the number of flooring failures began to increase, um, we started to use moisture mitigation at the 23rd hour, or we would test the slabs uh, a week or two before the flooring had to go in, found out they didn't pass, and now what are we going to do? Um, what are we going to put down to, to mitigate? And who's going to pay for it? That gradually uh, evolved into the, uh, if you will, uh, preemptive thought process where at least we now have selected a system, put a selected system and appropriated money for it in the budget. Now we got to that same 23rd hour, uh, tested the floors. If they pass, fine. The money and system, the system doesn't get installed, the money doesn't get spent, but if it's necessary, the system is there, the money's there. Um, because such a high percentage of slabs never uh, reached a condition where we didn't need a moisture mitigation system, uh, there are a, a, a huge percentage of projects that, and, and design firms and, and project managers who have just basically said from the get-go, uh, it needs to be part of the project specifications, part of the project budget, and it, it's going to be it's going to be done. Then the question becomes, are we going to wait to the 23rd hour when we're framed, sheetrocked, and all the trades are busy doing their, their thing? Or are we going to find a way to implement the strategy at the earliest stages of the process when the building is, is, is wide open and um, there's less conflict with 
with other trades. And that's really the way the uh, the industry is, is head, headed in certainly in the past uh, five years. Uh, in those cases, the bill is wide open. And and you know I don't I don't get involved with cost, but I can't imagine why it's not less expensive to do something when it's wide open than it is trying to shot glass and work your way around, particularly in a hospital, um, you know, in, in with all the petitions and everything else that are up. The other thing that can that the benefit that you can get um, slabs curl crack warp if you will uh, due to loss of volume, and by sealing the slab if you will. Uh, at an early age, before it's had a chance to go through a significant volumetric change, we uh, have the potential of minimizing, if you will, uh, random cracking, uh, joint movement, and uh, or, or or warping. So there's some number of distinct advantages to being able to successfully install a moisture mitigation leveling system at, a, at an early stage. Twenty nine. With the existing slabs on grade with no moisture vapor present, have you found a foolproof system that works 100% of the time for high moisture? I think I said this earlier, but I know of no company out there uh, that truthfully can state that they have a perfect track record over unprotected slabs on ground. Yes, there are some out there that say that too, but it's, they're not being truthful. And I can say that without apology. Okay? I'm not saying who they are. I'm just saying that anybody who tells you they've never had a failure I question. Okay. Uh, now, um, that said, what we've learned from the failures that we've investigated over the past X number of years is that there are ways to achieve a very high um, degree of potential uh, success, but it involves uh, a due diligence process that is not necessarily being followed. Uh, as often as it should be. There are things we need to know uh, about the concrete. We need to know uh, about the components in that concrete mixture. We need to know about uh, the variation in salts content from the very surface of the slab to the body of the slab. Uh, we need to know if there are potentially reactive aggregate particles in that concrete. But once we know all this, I do believe that we can successfully install uh, a moisture mitigation system uh, with a very, very high uh, potential degree of success. 30, if a flooring failure occurs and you're hired by a flooring manufacturer to inspect moisture or pH levels, how many RH, MVA, or pH tests would have to exceed basically the manufacturer's warranty limits for them to justify denial of a warranty claim? Well, that's going to vary uh, from manufacturer to manufacturer. And as I said earlier, the frequency of the number of tests that we perform in a forensic investigation is far less than the, the uh, requirement for pre-installation testing of a, of a flooring installer, a flooring inst uh, system, and and that decision of frequency, as I mentioned, was is really up to the inspector conducting uh, the study uh, to make sure that he has an, enough information to to make an informed decision, provide that information to the manufacturer of the flooring system or other parties uh, involved in, in the failure, uh, and then they can decide whether or not they are going to honor or, or not their warranty. Question 31, can one use a high RH environment that goes up to 99% when they're installing a floor finish that only goes to 85%? How is this okay when the adhesive is not blocking the moisture only tolerating? This is typically going over new construction, please explain. Uh, again, this is a question, in this case, for the manufacturer of the flooring material that has a limit of, of 85%. But we, we face this, this, this question on a, on a number of other um, uh, platforms where you have a, comp a composite assembly uh, of a concrete slab, uh, an underlayment material, an adhesive, and a flooring material or coating. The underlayment, the adhesive, and the flooring all have three different sets of acceptance criteria. Um, and the way we've handled it presently at ASTM is to say when that when that condition exists, uh, unless you can get a, a, a written uh, variance from any one of the uh, companies, uh, the most stringent, if you will, requirements apply. So you really need to abide by the 85% unless that manufacturer is willing to, in 
uh, review the other products and their acceptance criteria, if you will, and, and provide a waiver to you that you want to get it in, in writing. 32, and I think we're getting close to the last of the first group. ASTMF, that's supposed to be 3010, my, uh, my, my error. It is 3010, is significant for film forming membranes with various chemistries of penetrating products to suppress successive vape emissions. Is there a standard I can provide relevant to the effectiveness of non-film forming urethane products for moisture vapor? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm not aware of any non-film forming urethane product, okay? Um, there are uh, moisture cured urethanes being used as moisture mitigation treatments, but they do create a film on the surface. They, they, pen they are in the surface, but they also do create a film on the surface, okay? Um, to answer the question directly, I'm not aware of any standard, uh, although I do know our resilient committee is considering a standard uh, for single component moisture mitigation products. Okay. 33, how do I mitigate a slab on grade environment from high moisture for new flooring work? Uh, first of all, make sure there's a low permeance vapor retarder uh, underneath the slab, and secondly, contact your Ardex representative for guidance. 34, do you think we're losing quality to the, to the installation by using the fact track system? Not sure exactly what he's asking, uh, he or she. Uh, as it relates to fast track construction, uh, without question, quality can sometimes be, be compromised, but as it relates to addressing moisture and slab leveling in an early stage, I don't think so. 35, are there industry standards for categorizing the numerous types of MVER remediation products? We've seen, tried everything from mixed designs, time of placement, topical penetrating, topical after the pour, high performance adhesives, repair remediation, some kind of classification that addresses the type of application of chemistry would be helpful. Uh, sadly, there aren't, and they're not likely to be seen in, in the future. Now, that said, there are numerous articles out there on the various approaches being used as forms of, of mitigation, but they're not considered as industry standards. For early installations of moisture control and leveling that are within days or weeks of the concrete, is, how can you be conf uh, confident that deflection of the concrete is complete? Well, you can't. Um, there's initial deflection and then there's deflection over time. And the deflection over time, I mean, this concrete slab is placed. There's no weight on it. Now you come in, you start framing, you start loading. It, it all depends on what loads that uh, assembly is, is going to be just subjected to as to what uh, future degree of deflection, if you will, uh, will take place. 37, if all your subfloor preparation materials, including the flooring and adhesives, can withstand moisture readings, even at 100%, should you still use a moisture mitigation system? Um, it really depends on can that uh, adhesive withstand moisture is one thing. A saturated, high pH environment that attacks adhesive can be another. Can it withstand a prolonged or sustained saturated, high pH environment? And then also, if we're allowing that amount of moisture to come up and be directly underneath our flooring system, are we at risk for mold? Okay. Uh, what other problems can 99% reading uh, cause, even if the flooring and adhesive is the same answer? Uh, again, we have that potential. If we're allowing that moisture to just sit there, if you will, in or under uh, the, the flooring system and adhesive, uh, we do, we are at risk, if you will. Yeah, we've got a few questions here. We can get to maybe uh, two or three here in the time frame. Um, so how does carbonation of concrete happen and how can it be minimized or stopped? Okay, carbonation is an interesting phenomenon. It has two faces. If you subject a freshly placed wet concrete to high levels of carbon dioxide from uh, exhausts, it uh, could be a, a space heater, it could be a, a ready, a ready mix truck, could be a, a, a power trowel, anything that's exhausting carbon dioxide, uh, you can completely destroy the surface. However, if you place that concrete, finish that concrete, cure that concrete, and then it's exposed to atmospheric carbon uh, dioxide, it has the exact opposite effect. It actually uh, densifies and hardens. Chemically speaking, carbon dioxide, CO2, reacts with water, H2O, 
forms a mild form of carbonic acid that reacts with calcium hydroxide to produce calcium carbonate. So you're, you're likely not going to prevent it. You absolutely must prevent the early stage detrimental phase of it, uh, but you're not going to eliminate it uh, in the hardened state. And the carbonation process does lower uh, the pH from concrete's natural 12 and a half to 13, 12 to 13 range, down to somewhere between 8.4 uh, and, and 9. Okay, hope that answers the question. You're not going to get rid of it. Now, yes, you could if you if you felt it was necessary. You could remove enough of the surface of the concrete to remove, depending on how deep the carbonated layer runs. And the, the depth of carbonation for good quality concrete is approximately one millimeter a year. That's about a 25th of an inch. So it's a pretty shallow layer. So if you felt it necessary and it was shallow, you could remove it uh, by mechanical means. Great. Um, what are the disadvantages of integral crystalline capillary waterproofing additives associated when installing a floor covering or ceramic and porcelain tile? Crystalline waterproofing products, if you will, are, are, are just that. Waterproofing is not vaporproofing. Now, anything that is vaporproof is inherently waterproof, but not vice versa. Crystalline waterproofing products have absolutely no place uh, in a slab for a floor covering or coating system. Great. And then um, can a concrete substrate be within appropriate RH values, but be extremely high on the pH scale, therefore creating a hot slab? Well, we are currently at ASTM doing our best to get rid of pre-installation pH testing because the method that has been used for decades is, is flawed. And the reason it's flawed is because the way it's described uh, in a document that's not even a test method, F710, is to uh, apply a one-inch puddle of distilled or deionized water uh, let it sit on the surface for 60 seconds and then run the pH indicator paper through it. Now, if you don't have an external source of water and you lay that strip pH strip on the concrete, you don't get a measurement. And our point is this, okay, it's more important to know what the moisture level in the concrete is because if there's not sufficient moisture in the concrete to create a solution, pH isn't an issue. Now, without question, a, a pH, a, a high pH, a saturated high pH condition that attacks adhesives uh, is a major cause of flooring failure, but there is no acceptable practical means of making that determination uh, prior to the installation. As a post-failure forensic tool, invaluable, but we are doing our best to completely remove it as a pre-installation requirement. Great. Um, I think that might be all we have time for. Um, we can reach out to the other individuals that asked questions during the seminar today um, after the fact. Um, I just wanted to take a minute on behalf of the entire Artex team to thank you, Peter, for um, helping us out today and answering some of these questions. This is extremely invaluable information and we very much appreciate it. So. I, I want to thank everyone who who attended and and, and hung on for the whole thing. <laughs> and feel feel free to subject uh, submit any other questions that we didn't have time to to answer to Alyssa or Seth, and I'll be happy to try to respond. All right, sounds great. Thank you so much, Peter, and thank you everyone for attending. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Stay well, everybody. Bye, -bye. now.